Check one, two, check one, two. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody watching. We are super excited to be here today with our At Home with Nature series about energy. I'm going to pass it off to Raya, but I want you to get excited because we're going to pass it off to her in five. We're going to start learning about energy in four. We're going to start talking it in three. And Raya, why don't you take us away in two and let's skip one and pass it right to Raya. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be welcomed into your virtual classroom through your screen. My name is Raya, and um, I am a teacher with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. You can kind of see that on my shirt here. And the TRCA, um, our big thing is that we try to um, encourage others, as well as we do a lot of action to conserve, conservation, conserve, right? That kind of means like to protect, save, not use up. Now, also today, you heard Will already, and we've also got Jasmine here, if you can say hello, Jasmine. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited. <laughs> and we are talking about energy. So, um, I did also want to share that if you have any questions, you can by all means put them in the chat. Of course, we want to be responsible chat participants and make sure we're not goofing off in the chat, right? Relevant questions only. Otherwise, it's so confusing for us. And um, we are going to be answering some questions at the end. Have the worksheet then um, Will's going to pull the picture of that up right now then you can do that during the live stream or after whatever your teacher decides if you would like to request a worksheet for te teachers then you can um, click on the link that should be coming up in the chat shortly it's also in the description to ask for a worksheet there so let's get going ladies and gentlemen boys and girls I'm going to ask all of you to raise your arms up so stay seated but just raise your arms up shake them around wiggle them around and think to yourself oh my goodness this feels good, and I know that it's taking energy to do this, right? So how are we able to move our arms? Now that type of energy, that form of energy, the energy of movement is called kinetic energy, right? Energy of movement, we're moving. So that's kinetic energy, and um, that is made possible hmm, by fueling your body. So hopefully you had lunch today. Maybe you had breakfast. I hope you had breakfast, um, and that food that you took in was the fuel to get your body energized, right? So that fuel in your body is converted, your body does all these amazing things to convert it into kinetic energy to let you move, whether it's waving your arms in the air, you can put your arms down, by the way, if you're still having them up, um, or maybe getting up to get a drink of water or whatever movement you might do, even your heart beating, that energy is kind of, it's like an energy transfer from the food to your body. Um, and then out from there. My talking right now, that's like sound energy that I'm releasing right now, um, which I also had a delicious lunch. So that's helping to fuel my movement and my energy release. Now, um, when we think about where this energy comes from, maybe you had a sandwich for lunch. Maybe there was lettuce in that sandwich and that lettuce grew because what offered it energy? That's right. Maybe ja we can just point to the sun up there. Jasmine's my camera person for the moment here. So the sun is beaming down and providing all kinds of energy to us um, and to plants to allow them to grow. So the lettuce from your sandwich um, would have been growing in response to the sun's energy. And what else? Maybe you had some cheese in your sandwich. Well, that cheese came from maybe a cow, right? The milk came from a cow. The cow ate grain or whatnot. And um, that only grew because of the sun's energy. So it all comes back to the sun. Now, the sun doesn't create the energy. We can't create energy. We can't destroy it either, but we can transform it from one to another. So there's a lot going on in the sun. Here's a quick little close up of the sun that a friend of mine took. And there's so much going on in there. The sun is um, doing a whole special reaction with hydrogen in order to release the massive amounts of energy that the sun releases. We're not going to go into that detail today. It's just too much right now, but it's really cool. So. I'm going to put the sun down. Never thought I'd say that. And um, we are going to talk a little bit more about what the sun releases. But I wanted to mention that even though we can't create or destroy energy, we can still use up the energy sources on this planet. So we don't have an unlimited amount of energy sources on planet Earth. Here. All right. So the sun releases, well, if you can look out your window, you see it releases light energy. So that's one form. we got light energy from the sun. I'm feeling the heat energy from the sun. Um, and 
other types of energy. I mentioned sound before. We talked about movement, right? There's all these different forms of energy. Let's focus on heat because that's a really important one for humans. Without heat in the winter, we wouldn't be able to survive, right? So let's switch the camera angle here and talk about how we get heat. Well, essentially to get heat, we can burn stuff. And in the past, um, dung might have been burnt, right? So different like manure, essentially, cow patties and things like that. Um, coal can be burnt to produce heat. Wood can be burnt, maybe a campfire, but also wood stove producing heat or other types of uh, mechanisms by which to get that heat. In all of these methods, there is heat produced, but as you can imagine, there is other energy produced as well. So there's another output. Imagine a fire that's burning. What is the other output? Your goal is to have heat. That's your goal. But what else is produced? If you said light, then you are correct. That's what I'm getting at here. So light energy is being released, but it's kind of lost to the system. Like we don't need the light by producing heat. Um, we are aiming to have um, heat produced to warm ourselves. And the light is just in kind of a lost aspect of energy there. The uh, other uh, type of energy that we've moved to. Hey, Raya, I think it's a little hard to hear. Do you, would you mind speaking a little louder? Oh, sure. Thanks, Jasmine, for letting me know. I wonder if there's a setting on my device right now that makes it hard to hear. Oh, actually, I think we're all good now. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. We always have to manage our tech issues when they come up. So another um, thing that we can burn in order to get energy from it is liquid fuel, right? Those three other examples were solids. Liquid fuel um, turns into a gas. Pretty much if I was to open the tap, the, um, the piece here, the nozzle, then we'd see the gas coming out. But as we're burning this, it's the same idea. We're getting heat from that, right? Now, if this is being burnt in a furnace in a home this natural gas then or this fuel then the heat energy is fantastic that's what we're going for if there's any light or anything else that's lost in the system then that would be considered the energy that's lost however if this is going into a car um, fuel tank then as it is being burnt in the car to make the car move from one place to another the movement is our goal and what is the loss in that case? What is the energy that is lost when fuel is put into a car? In that case, the heat is actually considered lost. It's a lost energy form in that system. So when we think about how we are using different resources to produce energy or to transform energy into the, the uh, forms that we want to use, we also want to consider that some energy is lost and we want to minimize what is lost because if we can really increase the output we're going for, whether that's heat or movement, that's our goal. Just one last thought on the loss, because I love talking about animals. When you think about bees, for instance, then um, as a bee is buzzing, you can imagine like, what would it, you know, how do they sound when they're buzzing around? Well, their goal is maybe to get from one flower to another, but that sound energy is kind of a lost um, output. It's not really part of their goal of movement. Okay, that was a fair amount of chatter. Let's get into one of our demos here. So I'm gonna start off by showing you something kind of cool. You're like, Raya, that's just uh, water coming out of a tap. How is that cool? Well, I'll tell you why. So here we have um, water <laughs> that looks like left somebody the left the tap on. on. It's filling a bucket. And as we back up, and we've got the camera focused on the bucket there. As we back up, we actually see that it's attached to a, a system here. There is 30 meters down in the ground of a water pump that is drawing water up from the, uh, the water table. 30 meters, rather, down in the ground. And this water pump needs electrical energy in order to run. So how is that water pump running right now to fill up that bucket? At the moment, I'll show you, it is using solar energy directly. So we have a solar panel here, and it is transforming the sun's energy, that light energy, all those photons, 
into electrical energy, and that is fueling our pump. Now, we're going to, I'm going to show you something here. There are, we're talking about alternatives today too, right? So solar is one alternative, one method, these solar panels. Another alternative to filling up this bucket is by using mechanical energy. So transforming mechanical energy into electrical. And in a moment, we're going to have Jasmine come on the bikes, but I want to show you how this mechanism works first. So if the, when the bike turns, see if you can see this at the very bottom, get my angle right, that rod actually spins right down in there. And as that turns, well, this is mechanical right now, but we're transforming this mechanical energy into electrical here. And that will then go down to the ground to run the pump. So we just have to change the settings. Da, 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 da. And my phone, my device has a mind of its own sometimes. Here we go. So I'm going to change the settings here, turn the bicycle on, and the solar just went off. And you've seen in the picture on the side of the screen that our tap is starting to decrease in its production. And Jasmine, can you empty that bucket? Sure. Jasmine and I are trying to keep our distance here. It's a fun game during COVID times, isn't it? So we're emptying the bucket. You can empty it all the way. Awesome. Wow. That amount, actually, I should let you guys know, the amount of water in that bucket is about the amount of water that you use in each flush. I think it's like 20 or 25 liters. It's a fair amount. So <laughs> the, uh, the solar panel is no longer running this top. Jasmine is going to get over to our bicycle here and show us this method of mechanical energy transformation into electrical. And you can see on the side, when the tap starts going, it takes a few minutes, right? We're, we're transforming mechanical to electrical, and then that electrical has to go down to the water pump, and we're seeing the water start to come down. Jasmine, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. It's <laughs> taking a little a lot of my energy right now i think now jasmine what did you have for lunch to give you that energy so ryan for lunch today i had a spinach salad spinach salad okay hmm and where did the spinach get its energy from in order to grow so i think that that spinach would have gotten its energy from the sun the i had tomatoes in my salad i had onions in my salad as well and i think those all grew using the sun's energy Oh my goodness. Okay, so the uh, sun is indirectly powering this system. And let's see how our how full our bucket is. So keep pedaling there, Jasmine. I'm <laughs> making her work hard. And you might hear my voice double because I'm coming up to our other device that is focused on our bucket. All right. You'll see it's not very full yet. Maybe that's an inch or so. And thank you, Jasmine. You can actually stop pedaling now. Um, and so Jasmine was working pretty hard there in order to fill that bucket up. And um, we got about an inch. And that was, gosh, maybe a minute or so, minute and a half. Guess what? When the sun is having at her, we'll get this switch back, it takes about two or three minutes to fill up the entire bucket on a sunny day. So these are two alternatives to producing this electrical energy, whether it's the mechanical from the bike, which originated from the sun as well, right? Um, we have the sun growing the food that goes into Jasmine's body that then turns into this kinetic energy in her body and then mechanical with the bike and then electrical. Oh my goodness, what a row of cascading transformations there. Um, and then we have the solar panel, which is like a direct from the sun to the panel, to the pump. And gosh, that solar panel seems to be more effective. But we want to consider that on this planet, there are so many different alternatives and what energy was taken to create the solar panel. So we're not going to get into all that, but there are so many factors when you're starting to think about, okay, which one is more eco-friendly? If we have bikes that power things or solar panels, well, the benefit of the bike is Jasmine got some exercise too, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we've, we've talked about um, this solar alternative and this mechanical bike alternative with human power. I'm going to bring us over. We're on the innovation trail at the Court Center, actually. I didn't mention that. So we're at a really cool spot. My phone is definitely acting up. 
sorry guys, it's flipping all around. There we go. So, uh, Will, you can <laughs> we can pull away the uh, tap screen now. Thank you so much for sharing that. So here at the Courtright Center on the Innovation Trail, um, we have a field of solar panels and these are demonstration panels to help learn some aspects of how solar panels work. Now, the piece of this that I wanted to share with you is, again, when we're thinking about producing energy, we really want to maximize the efficiency. We want to make sure that whatever method we're using is, um, is getting the most output for the least input. So it's super efficient if we can do that, right? Looking at these solar panels, what do you notice is different right now in their placement? They are at different angles. So this one, we, the one we just looked at was kind of um, exactly vertical. We've got this one at a bit more of a tilt. The one after that is a bit more of a tilt. And this piece is, this information is really significant when it comes to using our alternative tools correctly. So if we want to maximize the efficiency, have the most output for the least amount of input, well, the solar panel was developed and we want to angle it the best way we can to the sun in order to maximize the output we're getting from it. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about different tools that might be used and oh, which one's more eco-friendly. A lot of it can depend on how we use that tool. Now, what's cool about solar panels, I always love relating everything to like wildlife. So I'm gonna just mention that um, the angle of the solar panels and maximizing that connection to the sun or that exposure to the sun is similar to what a butterfly might do when it lands, where the wings, might be open a little bit or open a lot, depending on the angle of the sun. So we can learn a lot about um, how to maximize energy efficiency, how to get the most output for the least input from wildlife as well. And a butterfly is one example of that when we consider solar panels. Now we are going to, in a moment, go down a trail and check out another alternative energy system. So another way that energy can be transformed from its source to a way that we humans might use it. And I imagine you might have some ideas just looking out here at the scene before us. If you can see Jasmine walking there in the distance, getting ready for another spot. So we're gonna be talking about wind turbines and wind energy. So wind energy, again, we can't create or destroy energy, but we can transform it. And um, how wind energy kind of wind made startup has to do with, you know, temperature differences, things like that. Um, then the wind starts up and we're I'm talking on a grand scale, like over the ocean, for instance, you might have differences in heat. And that wind, we consider that a renewable resource. We're not actually really using up the wind by um, harnessing its energy. Just like we're not really using up the sun to harness its energy. So those are both renewable ways of, um, of getting energy for us to use. Now, non-renewable, you might have heard these terms before. Those first examples I gave, burning stuff, right? Burning wood, burning uh, natural gas. So those are energy sources. There's like, you can imagine like, it's almost like there's energy sitting in there, like potential energy sitting in those, that wood, that coal, uh, that fuel. And those energy sources, once they're burnt away, we can't make them like come back just like that. It can take um, decades if we're talking about a tree to grow. It can take hundreds, thousands of years if we're talking about oil deep in the ground. So they're not renewable in any kind of sense that is helpful for us humans. All right, we have reached our wind turbine field here. So again, on this innovation trail at the Courtright Center, we are seeing some different designs of wind turbines. And what I wanted to point out here were a couple of things. We talked about the solar panels, like you have a tool, you want to use it correctly, right? You want to maximize what you're getting out of it. Same with the wind turbines. If your wind turbine is really low 
um, underneath the tree line, and I'll show you where the tree line is. There we go. There's a line of trees. So if the wind turbine is shorter than the trees, do you think that you're going to be getting a lot of energy from that turbine? If the wind can't get to the turbine, it's not going to work so well. So a couple of things about wind turbines. The spinny part, <laughs> the turbine part itself, has to be at least 10 meters above anything else around it for about a hundred meter radius, like a hundred meter stretch around it in every direction needs to be um, 10 meters lower than that turbine in order for it to really make sure it has access to enough wind to work. And um, when we think about designs, this one that's now in the, like in the front here, this one is an older design It's called the Darius wind turbine. And um, I believe it, uh, was kind of originated in France and then Canadian scientists perfected it in the late 60s. Have a look at the design. How is this different? Sorry, I'm just going to take a moment. I don't know if you can hear. I'm going to flip this around here. The wind just picked up and behind me there's a turbine that's whew, really catching that wind. Do you hear that sound? I wanted to point that out. It's, from my angle, I can totally hear the sound of it turning. And we talked about lost energy before. The goal is for the thing to turn and then we're harnessing energy down um, down below. But that sound, that's energy that's being released that's not being used. So that would be an example of lost energy in that system. Okay, back to the Darius wind turbine. So <laughs> um, there are so many different designs that you can look at when it comes to solar panels or wind turbines. And in this case, well, that's a whole different look than the one that is behind it in the background there. Um, the blades are kind of vertical more so than the one at the top in the background where the blades are in a different angle and so they can catch the wind differently and this turbine i don't actually know the details of why it didn't take off but the horizontal axis wind turbine so the one up there that style that one just seems to have, seems to have taken off as the design that most people have been using but I'd like to, I need to research more about this one to see, maybe it was actually a really good design and just didn't have the marketing it needed, right? Now this particular example is, can you tell me what's wrong with this situation here? It's too low, it's below the tree line. So that one doesn't turn very often, <laughs> not enough wind. All right, um, we're going to head over, I'm gonna show you like a kind of an old school wind turbine. You can picture it maybe on an old country road and a farm, on a farm property. But I did want to make sure that you consider this idea that there are so many design possibilities for wind turbines, for solar panels, for other alternative uh, methods of harnessing energy. And you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls in grade five and any other grade that's watching today, think to yourself, like, you could actually be an inventor of a whole new design of wind turbines or solar panels or whatever other method you are interested in getting into. These are just a few examples we have up here. There's another one up here. I didn't show you because it's kind of hard to see, but that's a that's a different design from the other ones we've seen. Okay, so I said I was gonna show you this old style. And by all means, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, and we're getting close to our question time. Going down a little trail here. Oop. So it's so walking on a trail. Dun, dun, dun over to here we go old school wind turbine like i said you can picture this one like on an old farm i think this one was actually brought in um a long time ago from another site as part of the demonstration now this one in particular is um harnessing wind energy and turning it into mechanical energy to run a pump so the water pump in the other case was electrical energy. This one is mechanical. And when the wind, wind is, uh, turbine is turning, this one's a little short, so it's not turning like the taller ones, then it actually pumps this up and down and the water um, pumps down through this mechanism into the tubing, down a pipe, and it ends up filling a pond that is over there behind those shrubs. We're gonna go there next. I wanted to show you that, it's gonna come over to the sign here. 
that there is a, another type of pump that can be run by human energy, right? <laughs> and or fueled by human power. And so in either case, just like with the, um, the bike situation, we're pumping groundwater up from deep in the ground, 30 meters down deep in the ground, where the water table is essentially. And so it can either be done with the turbine, it can be done by a human powered pump. I'm gonna see if I can show you how the human powered pump works here, see if I can get the right angle. And I don't, it's pretty hard to do. So I don't know if I'm gonna actually have enough gusto to start filling up that pump, but basically pumping up and down. Oh my goodness, that is a bit much. It might take a few, whew, a whole class of students to pump this enough to get this uh, water moving. I didn't make a dent. <laughs> All right, we've talked about alternative sources of energy. We talked a little bit about renewable and non-renewable. We talked about um, how you can be creative. Oops, I'm not looking at me at all, sorry. I uh, <laughs> meant to have my face on here and then I looked away and it shook. Um, and we talked about how the sun is the source of really all energy on this planet. Oh, but do you hear that? I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna see if you can hear the sound. Why are we doing this anyway? What's the point of um, considering these alternatives? Well, there's human value, right? We want to be able to survive. And so we need energy to do that. But there are so many other organisms on this planet who need us to not use more than our share. If you can hear the peeping, peep, peep, peep. Those are spring peepers. They're frogs, little tiny frogs, about the size of a nickel. Can you hear that? They have a little X on their back. If you ever, I've only seen one like once or twice. They're so sweet. And then we've got another type of frog, which I'm forgetting the name of. If one of our folks from the TRCA who are responsible for our chat knows the name of the other frog that's clucking away there, you can put it in. And we set up, you probably can't see it from your angle, but we set up a scope here because we wanted to show you one of the animals that actually is in this pond that is um, here as part of the innovation trail. And we have the screen to show what the cope show, scope shows. Oh, that's a whole lot of fun. Check it out. In the pond right now, there are numerous, maybe I'll, I can turn this screen, numerous little turtles. So all this wildlife needs good, healthy habitat. And if we decide to, you know, burn too much stuff essentially, and we destroy habitat to do that, if we are using too much energy, then this wildlife doesn't have a home. There are a couple of mallard ducks in the middle there. I'm not sure if you can see them. Oops, there we go. I can't turn the scope away from the turtle, unfortunately, to show them up close. So when we think about, when we think about um, all these alternative sources of energy, we really also want to conserve energy. It's not just about, oh, I switched to solar or I switched to wind, therefore I can use as much as I want because it's renewable. Well, it still took energy to make a solar panel. It's still, and resources. It took energy and resources to make a wind turbine. And they don't last forever. So we don't want to, you know, use them if we don't have to. Conserving energy is another key part of this whole energy conversation. And when we think about energy conservation, then um, we can again take our cue from wildlife. So earlier I showed the butterfly as an example of wildlife that we can learn from, you know, the way they angle their wings, we can angle our solar, solar panels just right. Another um, example of wildlife we can learn from is, I'm just getting it out of the bag here, sorry. I see in the middle of my nose there. I get up close, is this guy. So a chickadee 
is a bird that, like many other birds, when they get cold, guess what they do? They fluff up their feathers. That's one of the things they'll do. They'll fluff up their feathers to create a thicker layer of insulation, and that can hold their heat in better. And so when you think about what you're putting on in the winter to stay warm, to conserve energy, instead of turning up the heat in your house and using more energy, burning more fuel, you can think about, well, I'm just going to put on some big, fluffy, warm layers. I'm going to put on some wool socks. There are animals. I'm just pulling out a picture here to show you that we can learn from who are terrestrial. So the bird is like an avian animal. But if we think about foxes, like this guy here, look at that thick, thick coat. Again, with this thick layer of fur, they are able to hang out in the winter and go about their fox lives. <laughs> and we can learn from that as well. So if we dress better in the winter, we don't have to use as much energy to stay warm, right? Other, you can probably think for yourself about ener examples of energy conservation. Maybe you've talked about this, biking instead of driving. I mean, that's, a, that's one that um, a lot of people like to do, or walking instead of driving. So we've talked about quite a bit. And I, I always like to end on like, what can we do? And so we've talked a bit about energy conservation. I want you to think about more and you can put them in the chat if you like more examples of ways that we can conserve energy, maybe examples of things we can learn from wildlife or how we can conserve energy. Um, if you need, to, if you need, we're gonna answer some questions, but if you need to go at this point, then by all means, we wanna thank you so much for joining us and um, taking part in our Nature in Your Classroom live stream today. But we'll be on for another 10 minutes or so to answer questions. So thank you for those who need to go. And um, as far as questions go, Jasmine, do we have any questions that I can answer? Hi, Raya. Yeah, so we have gotten some questions in the chat. Um, one of the questions was about the solar panels that you showed earlier. And one question about those was, does the sun always need to be out for the solar panels to work? That is a great question, Jasmine. I thought you might like to look at the turtle instead of me um, for a moment there. So in order for the solar panels to work, they do need that light energy from the sun. But what you can attach to a solar panel is a battery. So if the solar panel is transforming more energy than what is needed for the use that you're doing, you know, um, in a given moment, then like that water pump, that was a lot of water. Like when we first arrived at that bucket, it was spilling over. So if it's producing more energy, you could attach a battery to it. That one didn't have one, but you could attach a battery to it to store that energy. And then when it's dark or when there's not enough sun or it's too cloudy, then, um, then you can use the energy that was stored. So it does need sun in order to work, um, but there are ways to kind of get around that, that restriction. Great, amazing. Um, another question we had uh, about the solar panels is asking, why are they different sizes? Are they better when they are bigger? Good question. Um, there are so many, I mean, that it sounds like a small question probably, but it's kind of a big question. There are so many different factors that come into solar panels. Like um, there are many different designs. I didn't get into that, but uh, there are many different designs of solar panel. Um, and so, depending on the design, maybe that impacts what size one might need. A larger solar panel um, will certainly have more of those little cells, the photovoltaic cells that can then harness the energy of the sun. So a bigger solar panel in general will capture more energy and transform it to um, electrical or usually electrical, like it was gonna say mechanical or whatever you need, but generally electrical. Um, so bigger usually means you can capture more, but it also depends on how effective it's it was designed as right and also if it's bigger but not facing the sun at a straight angle it's not going to be as effective as a smaller one that is facing the sun at a direct angle so there are a few different factors to consider amazing okay we have another question from bob and bob is asking does it take more energy to build a bike and feed jasmine or to build a solar panel so i don't know if you know the answer but what what do you think ryan i'm i'm so glad you asked i don't know the answer i'll be upfront with that um I am glad you asked because that is a big part of what I want everybody to be thinking about here, right? We're comparing the amount of um, Earth's resources that are used in having an output happen. In this case, having the water bucket filled. So the sun, the solar panel, like I said earlier, it takes maybe two or three minutes on a sunny day, whereas it would take 
um, probably a few jasmines because the first one will get tired and the second one will have to hop on <laughs> in order to fill it. Um, and to grow the food to feed jasmine, I mean, she needs to eat for other reasons as well. So that factors in. I don't know the answer to that one. It does take a fair amount of energy to produce a solar panel. So I don't have a straight answer for it, but it's a really important question. I mean, that's all about how efficient is a system and how many, how much of the Earth's resources we're using to create uh, results. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we have another question from JR, and JR is asking, why do butterflies have to angle their wings the right way to the sun? So I know you touched on this earlier, but I'm wondering if you can expand a little more. Yeah, so butterflies, they, um, they get a lot of their energy from the heat of the sun, and they really want to heat up their bodies so they can fly around and move the way that uh, they need to and to access their food and everything. Um, and if their wings were closed, I'm not gonna close these ones because I don't wanna break this model, but if the wings were closed entirely, then only this amount would maybe see the sun, right? Half the butterfly, hopefully that's in focus. And if they're open, then they've increased how much of their wings have access to the sun. Now, let's see if I can put this butterfly in the shade. So if the wings are in such a position that they're actually like one wing is shading the other, they're not getting that full access. So by opening or closing the wings until they have the perfect direct angle with the sun's rays, so they're maximizing how much sun is getting onto those wings, then they can get a lot more energy from the sun in a minute, let's say, than if they were kind of at an angle that doesn't um, offer them as much sunshine onto those wings. I hope that was kind of clear enough. <laughs> It's a tricky one to show without better props, I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, we have another question from Bob, and Bob is asking, does eating less meat help to conserve energy? Does eating less meat help people save energy? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so I don't know if it helps people to save our own energy, but in the world, eating less meat, it takes... In the world, eating less meat means there's less energy being used to produce that food. So it takes a lot of energy and time and commitment to grow the crops that are needed for the meat that people eat to grow. So like cows eating grain and whatnot, right? It takes a lot of energy to produce the food and also the water that all this livestock needs to eat. And so if we eat less meat, then... Um, there is less energy that has to go into that system to happen. There's a whole lot of other factors around there. I won't get into too much of this rabbit hole of a story, but um, like when you think about the space that is used up for agriculture to produce, to produce livestock or have livestock grow. Um, so if you are eating a higher diet in vegetables or in grains um, yourself, then you are having less of a negative impact on the planet when it comes to how many resources are on the planet. It's a good question. I don't know if, as far as the human body is concerned, like how much energy does it take to digest the meat and that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. big picture, yeah, reducing meat consumption is a good idea. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we have another question from Janet who's asking about the older wind, uh, wind turbine that you showed. And they're wondering if it still works. <laughs> It does still work, um, to be honest. So I don't often, I usually work at a different site. I'm not always at the core at center. The times I've been here, I haven't seen it spinning, but I have seen it facing different directions. It has a bit of a, a panel in the back that um, moves according to the wind. Because it's kind of low, it's below the tree line. Um, oh, it's turning just a tiny bit now. Because it's kind of low, it probably isn't um, in the most efficient location. And um, But if it was, then it does... It does still work. It just doesn't uh, get to do that very often because of its height, I think. I'll turn it again so you can see the back of it. So it was just moving. For, you can see it moving a tiny bit there. Um, but it's not going nearly as fast as the ones that are further in the background here. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay, we're going to have end off with two questions. So our first question before we end off is, um, what's the main reason solar panels were invented? And this is from Audrey. And I think we can kind of answer that question thinking about our other, you know, our wind turbines as well. Why were these created? 
Yeah, so wind turbines and turbines in general, like water turbines, they are actually really, really old. The new style that we see, that's kind of a newer design of them. But um, gosh, like, I don't know how many years ago exactly, but at least 100, I want to say 150, probably um, turbines have been in existence. And we just kind of, as we've been looking in the last you know, several decades thinking about, okay, we need to find alternative energy sources that are renewable. That's where we've sort of redesigned them more. Um, solar panels, oh gosh, I don't, I read the year the other day and I don't remember the year that they were first <laughs> designed, but um, the idea of the sun providing energy is an idea that's been around for a very long time. And the technology to develop the solar panels, I wanna say it was at some point in the last several like in the last half century, but I don't actually know for a fact. It could have been in the early 1900s. I don't. Does anybody else know on our TRCA backend team? <laughs> it's a good question. I just don't have the answer at the tip of my fingers. Uh, at the tips of my fingers. <laughs> Great. Well, we'll end off with one final question, and that question comes from Carly T, who is wondering, can we visit this location? Oh, good question. Yeah. So, the Courtright Center. Um, at the moment, I don't believe it's open to the public. I'll have to double check on that. Like I said, it's not my main site. But if you were interested in checking out the Innovation Trail virtually, um, I do know that sometimes tours are available. And you can go to the Courtright website and contact them through the website to see if, um, to see if the Innovation Tour innovation trail tours <laughs> are available these days and uh, and kind of learn more. We just did a really brief overview of some of the pieces of the trail, um, but there is a lot more that can be learned and shared on the innovation trail at the Courtright Center. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. I just found out that apparently the first uh, solar cell was created in 1883. So also very old technology. It's been around yeah. for quite a while. Excellent. Thank you for looking that up before the 1900s. Perfect. <laughs> so thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in today. Um, it's been great to be welcomed into your spaces. And we will have another live stream coming up in two weeks. And um, hope to see you there. I'm going to turn the camera to the pond. And I'll be quiet for just a moment so you can actually hear this chorus of frogs behind me, which is just beautiful as we sign off. So thank you, everybody, for joining and keep getting outside. Thank the sun next time you go outside for all the energy it provides. <laughs>